So um, we are on our bioinformatics page, Rockefeller uh, University .github .io, and it's here. We're going to have all our training um, with Matt, who's been putting us all together, organizing all this and done a fantastic job. Um, we have some of our courses and we should have been through intro to R. We've done some plotting, um, the tidyverse abridged, and we've done a little bit of the reproducible. So now in this week, we're going to start and trying to focus our skills in R on bioinformatics data, in particular, in particular genomics data, um, just what Connie has been talking about. So to get that started for the week, we're going to have what is a non-programming uh, little lecture. Um, and this is going to cover here. This is on this page. Like all our other ones, you can link. We have our slides. We have our exercises, compilation times to make sure it's all working. There is no programming. So everything is working. And we're going to start and just go through this first lecture here, which is our reference genomes and genomic files formats. Okay, so I'm going to do this in the next half an hour. Um, we have another session, which I might just knock on to IGV, depending on how we go with this. So first, genomics data. What are we going to cover now? Well, first, we're going to talk about reference genomes. These are essential. These are the files which contain the full sequence for the genomes we're interested in. And we're going to talk about the GRC. This is the Genome Reference Consortium, not the Genome Reference uh, Resource Center, which we've just seen. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the formats we'll see, FASTA and FASTQ. These are our unaligned sequences. FASTQ is what you'll get straight from Connie. SAM and BAM, these are our aligned sequences, so we know where our FASTQ, our sequence data, fits on the whole genome. And then we're going to cover some formats of summarizing these. These include BED, GTF, GFF, ways of summarizing information in the genome, wiggle files, bed graphs, but most usefully big wigs, genomic scores, uh, VCF and MAF. I don't do much genomic variation analysis, but I'm going to talk about that today. We have, I think, G Dung in the audience somewhere. Um, sorry. We have G Dung somewhere in the audience who can jump in if I say anything wrong. And finally, um, really fitting with what Connie was talking about with single cell, just going to talk about how we handle some of this data too. So first off, reference genomes. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So um, human genome isn't complete. We're always making changes to our model genomes, our reference genomes. Um, they are being updated. In fact, most model organisms still aren't complete. They are being regularly updated. So when we talk about a reference genome, what we really mean is a mixture of known chromosomes, your chromosome one, two, and unplaced contigs. So these are stretches of sequence. We still aren't sure where they fit within the chromosomes. We know they're part of the full genome, but we don't know where they go. Taking this all together, our known chromosomes, our unplaced contigs, we could call this our genome reference assembly. So major revisions, major changes to a genome reference uh, assembly would include things which change coordinates. So we're actually adding more sequence within our full reference genome. This is going to move the coordinates of a gene, maybe a few hundred base pairs down or upstream. So this is going to be something what we call a major revision to our, to our genome. Um, this means that you can't easily transfer information from one genome version to another. We need to convert these coordinates. It's a bit of a pain. The latest genome we have for human, for instance, is GRC38, but we would have had a GRC37 or 36. And we need to keep careful attention of our major version for our genome, because um, usually when we change major versions, this is a lot of work. We have to realign or do all these conversions. On top of these major versions, such so as the 38, we also have these minor versions to the genome, changes to the genome. And these include little patches. We may change a sequence or where the name of a gene. Um, and these would be attached to our major version. We would have GRCH38. And then we would have patch three. Okay. So this is something to keep an eye on. Changes to, say, particular base pair sequence. But it's these major revisions we really need to be concerned about. So the GRC, this Genome Reference Consortium, um, really deals with three major genomes. 
human, mouse, and zebrafish. Okay, so they have they're taking control or taking responsibility for maintaining these genomes, making them available to people. But there are lots of mother model organisms uh, available, and you'll find like Drosophila. That's on this um, Berkeley Drosophila genome project. If we were interested in mosquito, you would go to Vectorbase, um, and you would find the genome probably constructed by the Vossel lab there. So why do we need these reference genomes? Why are they important to us? Well, we need a reference genome in order to put our data, our shallow sequencing really into context of the full genome. Right? Without a reference genome, we don't know where our genes and genomic features, how they relate to each other. We can't evaluate that in this linear context. So we don't know that gene A is close to gene B. And we don't know things like features like gene A and gene B are within this bigger feature, maybe a TAD a uh, topologically associated domain. And that might be important to us because it means they're going to be sharing regulatory regulatory domains um, and that type of information we want to know. On top of knowing the relationship between elements in our genome, how far away from each other, like I said originally, this is going to allow us to do our shallow targeted high throughput sequencing. You can go to Connie and sequence your 25 million reads, 30 million reads, and align that to this pre-built map of the organism's genome. So reference genomes are really essential. And as Connie uh, talked to us through in great detail, we can go with that, we can go from our DNA, cDNA, we can fragment this, we can amplify it, sequence it. And then with the sequences and knowing the, the full sequence of our reference genome, we can use tools and software to place our unaligned sequence onto the part of the reference genome where they match. Okay. Can keep track of time. So as I said, a reference genome is a collection of contigs, known and unplaced contigs. Um, a contig is a stretch of DNA sequence encoded in A, G, C, T, and N. There are other um, alternatives to N, which could be a combination of A and G. But generally, these are the three, four, Five, which are accepted in FASTA format. And FASTA format just looks like this. It is a identifier line. This tells us the information on the uh, following sequence. So here we have this greater than sign. We have some information on what this is. It's telling us it's chromosome one of the GRCH38 primary assembly. And then this going on for a long time would be the full sequence of our chromosome one. After a while, we'd get past that sequence, we would have another header line, maybe saying chromosome two, and that would carry on. And this file would be huge, but importantly, it has sequence information here. And for every bit of sequence information, it has this header line saying what the sequence was. Okay, so that's our reference genome and that's essential. <clears throat> what Connie was just talking about was producing these uh, unaligned sequence files from her high throughput sequencing machines. Okay, so what we really want to do, the primary step, the, probably the first thing we do in processing, maybe after QC, is to take our unaligned sequences and try and map these to our reference genome and produce a, a line sequence file. And typically, an aligned sequence file will be something like SAM format. Okay, so we have our FASTQ, our unaligned sequences before we've applied this mapping to the reference genome. And then post that, we have our SAM format. Okay, so this is what FASTQ looks like. It is just a text file. It is often compressed to gzip to save space, right? But actually, in its heart, if you unzip it, you can open it up in TextPad. I don't recommend that because it's going to be big, but you can look at it in a text editor. If I just take some lines here from our FASTQ, we have one entry, and this is one read, one sequence from the machine, and it covers here four lines. And if we look at this, we have our identifier line. So rather than having a greater than now, we have our at sign, and then we have an identifier. We then have the actual sequence we got back from the machine. So this is the sequence across the cycles, right? And that's our sequence information. We have a separator, which was a plus. Sometimes you'll find the copy of the ID after that. And then we have here quality scores encoded as ASCII. 
right? So rather than putting in a probability that this base is A, it's put in that probability encoded as a ASCII character, right? This is just to save us space. So we can start to step through that because there's a lot of information which is really useful in this fast queue. First thing is we have our header. Again, uh, fast queue is just faster with qualities and we can already see that here. We have our ID sequence and then just the quality lines is additional. The header contains our machine name. Okay, so if we have our machine name, we can actually work out when it was sequenced, what uh, machine we used. We have our flow cell. Okay, so we were on the fifth flow cell. And then we actually have some, do I go into details on this? We actually have positions within the read, within the flow cell here. And then finally, we have this slash one, or it could be slash two. And this is like Connie was saying, we can have either end of a paired read. Right, so we've sequenced either end of a fragment. Now, in this case, we have one end of the fragment. Okay. But this bottom line, this is the real addition to which makes fast Q, fast Q, right? It's the qualities. This follows the plus line, and this is our minus log 10 probability of a sequence base being wrong. And this is encoded in ASCII to save space. If you put probabilities underneath every single value, you're going to have a huge file. So what they do is they bin this into quality bins, and then they put an ASCII representing that quality bin. Okay, this isn't great for us. We could probably have an idea that the hash is a low quality, because right, it seems to be at the end of reads, but we're going to need a computer to translate this back for us. Okay, this can this will then be used in your quality assessment. When did my read stop looking good? When did it start to go bad in quality? Um, and also we could use this in downstream analysis. Maybe we're going to down weight a, we, a read if it's um, of low quality. Okay, so this is unaligned data, right? It contains lots of information. I did have a little reference here for FASTQ format. If you're really interested, FASTQ format on Wikipedia has a really lovely description of FRED. And it tells you how a score is encoded into an ASCII character. As I say, the computer is going to handle this for us, so we really don't need to worry. So the next thing we're going to look at is SAM format. So this is now our aligned format. It's called Sequence Alignment Map. Um, and what's really important about SAM format, like with VHS and Betamax, or something more modern reference, um, it has become the standard format for sequence data. Illumina themselves had a land format, but SAM has certainly won the format war for sequencing data. Um, which means now that it's recognized by a majority of software um, and genome browsers. And this is what we're going to cover later. If you come with some of these old formats, you're not going to be able to use these in other tools. So the SAM header, the SAM format is very useful and contains a lot of uh, great information. The first thing we have in it is a header. Okay, and this is really good because it actually describes what's going to go on in the rest of the file. Okay, and at the very front of the file, it describes things like the version number. Okay, so this is version 1.4. Really importantly, do I say this in the next slide? It has the sorting order. So I know that the reads in my SAM file are sorted by their coordinate position. Okay, so I can read that in the first line of my SAM file rather than having to check my SAM file. And then we have our contigs, um, and this is the order that they will appear in the BAM. We have our chromosome 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever. And then we have the length of our contig. Okay, so this tells us a lot about the genome we've aligned to, but also about the file, um, what the version was, and the actual order of the reads in there. Are they being coordinate sorted? The read itself, um, sorry, the yeah, aligned read itself, is actually one line here now in a SAM file. So in a bat, in a FASTQ, it was four, right? ID, sequence, quality. So a SAM file contains much of the same information. We can see the ID here, quality, uh, sequence, but it also contains importantly, now alignment location where this read aligns to a reference genome, but also, um, quality, how well it aligns to that genome, and other information about that actual alignment. 
So if we look, like I just said, it's got the same information as we had in the FASTQ by default. It doesn't need to, but it does by default. And we have the read name here, we have our sequence, and then we have the quality. So really a copy of the information we have in the FASTQ. But additionally, now we have, importantly, the chromosome we align to and the actual position, the start position, the read aligned to. Okay, so it starts aligning at this position in the genome on chromosome two. And then we have here a really useful bit of information. This is our, our, <coughs> our cigar string. So the cigar string really describes how this has aligned to the genome. Okay, so here we could say this read, this identifier uh, is aligned at this position in chromosome, this position in chromosome two. And it's done it for 100 matches. My read is 100 uh, bases long, and I have a stretch of 100 matches versus the genome. Right? Perfect match. If we look above, though, we have this 28M, 1D, 27M. Okay, and this is again what we call a cigar string. It is uh, run length encoded, but we just need to look at this and we can say 28 matches, one deletion, and 27 and 72 matches. Okay. So we have a re read, which doesn't quite know, are really useful, again, for us, but also the computer. We have the paired, if this is paired, we have where the pair has, has mapped what the insert size is, so the difference between the, dis the distance between the ends of the reads of the pair one and pair two. We have this little bit of information here, which is a single number. So this is our flags. So it's actually our kind of quality and more information about our BAM file. So this isn't really human readable. We have here 147. But if I go to this link here, I can actually get it to translate this for me. You can see this means the read is paired. Um, it's mapped in a proper pair. The read is on the reverse strand, and it is the second in the pair. Okay, so just that number is able to tell me a lot of information, and that's how these computers can parse this information, and then we can use that in further analysis. At the end here, and another great feature about SAM files is we can add user-defined flags. These are complex, they can have lots of definitions, um, but it's here that we may have information which is really specific to your particular analysis. If you're doing clip, you may have different information in these additional tags than you would if you had RNA-seq. Okay, so the FASTQ and SAM formats um, really summarize our FASTQ data, our sequencing data, and then how they've aligned to the genome, but they are big files. As we saw, they have all the sequence information, all the quality, and then the SAM files will have all this. And on top of that, they will have where it aligned um, information on the alignments. So that's a lot of information. Actually, post alignment, we often want to summarize things like SAM files into um, a score, maybe number of reads, amount of signal I have over a particular position in the genome. These files we can work with a lot easier. They've summarized, they've already extracted the information we wanted, and then we can start to operate there. So three really major formats we're gonna look at now are BED, so browser extendable data. So this is things like genomic intervals and any information. From this position in the genome to this position, we have this score. We have Wiggle, which is less popular now, BED graph, and these are what you would view in a genome browser, often per base pair, what is the level of signal? And then we have our GFF, also GTF. And these are how we store genomic annotation, how a gene fits to the genome. And we can add additional information and scores. So I'm just gonna step through these quickly. They are simple formats. First, most simple format in genomics is I think the bed file. So the bed file, and this is bed three here, just needs chromosome, the start of a feature and the end of the feature. There's no description about what the feature is, no associated score, no strand information, right? But we know something happened at this position in the genome. Okay, so this is the most simple 
format we can have. Extending that a little bit in a common format would be bed six. Okay, so this is the same chromosome start end, but now we have an identifier, so something to uniquely name this particular region. We have a score, so I could say I have 10 reads in this region, I have 11 amounts of signal, and then we have the strand. Okay, so we can be on the positive or the negative strand. Um, that's represented by positive or negative. If we don't know a strand, if there or if there is no real meaning in a strand for this feature, we could put a dot. Okay. So often you'll see a dot for things like ChIP-seq because they're kind of strandless. So bed files are very um, commonplace across genomics. Extending this a little bit are these narrow peak and broad peak, and it was really ENCODE who brought these to you know, the foreground. Um, and really they just allow us now to contain p-values and q-values because they're peak calls. How likely is this really a peak? Um, and then a narrow peak is really just bed six with an additional four columns containing p-values, q-values and score. And a broad peak is just bed six plus three additional columns. Okay, so we're going to come across these from ENCODE um, later on, I think maybe even in our IGB session coming up. These are just like bed with additional information for p-values and q-values. The really cool thing about narrow peak and broad peak was that they are very well uh, catered for in some other programs now. IGV displays these files very well. A really common practice we'll do in genomics is to take your data. Once it's aligned to the genome, we'll summarize the signal maybe per base pair, and we'll want to review this view this in an IGV or some genome browser. Okay, so for every position or every position where we have signal, what is the signal at that position in the genome? So formats existed from this, wiggle, um, I don't know why it's called wiggle, um, bed graph, um, bed with a graph, right? We can view it in the IGV. So these formats exist for this. Um, wiggle, which isn't so popular, but we can talk about it uh, anyway, really is a variable step format. You have an information line at the very top. This tells you the chromosome, right? We're going to be working on because there's no chromosome column here. You can have a step size. So this tells us we're going to be stepping in steps of five. And then we have our start position. So at this position until this position, we have a score, which we see here. Okay, so then going through in, in steps of five through the full genome, we can have from here to here this score, from here to here this score. But with this file, we can maybe visualize this and start to get an idea of how my signal looks across the genome. You know, an immediate issue with this is it's kind of lossy. From here to here, or it's kind of, um, it's a lot of information, really. It's in a lot of... Uh, text in order to describe this uh, information contained within it. This here, this lines 10 to 14, they're all the same score, right? So maybe we don't need to have all that information about where the steps were, okay? So bed graph slightly gets around this problem. It actually is just bed three with one more column for score. So it can't be stranded, bed, bed graph. But what it does is it allows for these variable steps. So we have chromosome one from here to here, we have a score of one. But in order to uh, represent the end of the chromosome from 10,051 to you know, our end position, as I've said, we have zero. I haven't had to write out a line every five bases to represent this, okay? So to do that same region and wiggle would take a long, a lot of text. Okay, so another feature which is super useful is GFF or alternatively GTF is a very similar format. And this is used to contain genome annotation. Again, it looks a lot like a bed file, chromosome start end, but we have some additional information um, such as IDs here, source, type, um, which allow us really to handle this type of data, which is often gene models. Okay, so we have chromosome start, end, strands, so very much like a bed file. 
and then we have source our feature type and we have a score column here again dot represents we don't have a score for this what is really useful about these particular file formats though is that it might be a few minutes over is that um, they contain these key pairs separated by semicolons and this would be a feature name so this line may represent an exon but this exon is a part of this gene so when it comes to summarizing our scores our BAM files if we can use it in combination with this file we can get a score across an exon but we can also know that this exon belonged to this gene and we can use that to summarize up all the scores on exons belonging to a gene okay this is also good for when we're going to visualize gffs it knows to place connections between exons which are on the same genes so this is now really the dominant format for containing genomic information on gene markers Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about genomic variants. Um, so here we have the VCF and the MAF format, and VCF is a really popular var format, variant call format, and then we have this mutation annotation format, so summarizing it into the annotation. So VCF is a text file, most likely in a compressed manner, so you're going to see this zipped in some way, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit at the end. It is going to contain, contain, like a SAM file, meta information lines and a header line, right? So information on what is in that file itself, and then the actual lines containing the data uh, where a mutation is in the genome. Okay, so if we just look at a VCF, and we're going to, Ji Dang is going to come and give a proper um, intro to these in his slides and his course. But we can see we have the metadata information here and this describes actually these elements here in this info what these all mean so we have and uh, let's take a good one this is the ancestral allele aa and you can see it's contained here this is great because we can read this and then we know how to deal with the rest of the file but on top of that we have some simple things chromosome the position the id so if we know it's a known snip we may have an id here the actual sequence of the reference, again, the same as here, the alternative, the quality, whether it passes our filter. And then we have additional information on our samples here. And we can obviously read our metadata to get our information on what's going on. The math format is, again, a tab delimited format. A lot of our uh, text like files are in tab delimited. And this can contain the aggregated mutation information from our VCF files. Okay, so now it's going to be more gene focused. And we have the gene that our mutations are within. We have the symbol, the actual entrees gene ID. So we use entrees a lot. Um, it's a type of ID which is very central to bioconductor. We have the center, we have the NCI build. So here we're on the last, the last build of the genome. Because earlier on I was saying GRCH38. I'm assuming this is human 37. Chromosome, start position, end position, strand, and we have some really useful things like what type of variant this is, right? A splice site, that might be very interesting to us. A silent mutation, maybe not. The variant type, um, and then information on our reference allele and how it's been called in our various samples. Okay, so math and BCF, I've just rushed through, but Ji Dang is going to have um, some more time to talk those through and actually using them later on. Okay, so I've got a few more slides. I am going to be over by a little bit, but not by much. Okay, so we've seen that SAM files hold our sequence information post alignment. We know that Wiggle or bed graph can hold our per position uh, score in the genome. We could do something very similar with bed, but really bed is more for features, longer features perhaps. And then we saw VCF and our GFF, BCF holding our variants and GFF holding our models. Okay, these are all basically, or at basics, just text files. We can open them in TextPad and we can review them um, and probably even work out the scores over our regions, do our calculations by hand. This is obviously not efficient um, and we're not gonna do this anyway. So really what we can do um, is maybe compress these files into a format 
which is easier to pass around. But by adding a index to this, saying where in the file is the information we need, we can then actually allow a computer to access this um, much faster and a much more efficient way. So all of our files have some type of an equivalent which is more efficient and compressed. SAM files we can make into BAM files, so sequence alignment map, a binary alignment map. And when we do that, we can index this file with a .bai, and it's that which allows us then to rapidly retrieve information from our SAM file without having to read the whole SAM file into memory. Remembering these files are big. Connie was talking 800 million reads. I mean, that's for the whole lane maybe, but this is these are big files. And having ways of computationally efficiently extracting information out of them is very important. Wiggles and bed graph, you won't ever see now, you'll see big ones. Um, these are a format which actually contains the index within the file, but this is random access. We can just open up parts of the file as we need without having to read the whole file into memory and then interrogate it. We have the same thing for bed, with big bed, um, and in fact, a slightly more popular format for bed, VCF and GFF, is to, oh, it's not quite good, it's a, a special type of zip, and we can create an index file for what is tabix indexing, and that will be a top.tbi. Okay. So all of these files, as we work with them, we're going to be using these BAM, BigWig, BigBed, um, and these tabix formats of them, versions of them, but the information with the inside them is the same as we've just shown. It's just allowing a computer to be able to access it more efficiently. So the last thing I wanted to add um, to this current section is some information on how we store assays and metadata. Okay, and this really follows on from what Connie was talking about single cell and what G-Dome will teach later in the sessions. We need better ways of storing our experimental assays. Um, typically, our experimental assays, when we were doing RNA-seq, chip-seq, these can be summarized in combinations of tables. Sorry about that. An example, a result could contain our, say, let's say, RNA-seq measurements for our samples across in the columns and maybe our genes in the rows. So we have a measure for every gene and every sample what the total signal in that gene is. We may have a sample to metadata table, which contains our, these samples are in these particular groups. These samples have this particular QC. And we want a table of gene to gene information. This gene um, has this particular score associated with it. This gene is just this symbol. This is the entrees ID. And on top of that, we may start to perform some transformations on our data, which we want to keep with our data. And this may be things like dimension reduction um, and some of these things which uh, Connie showed earlier in terms of things like TISNI. Okay, so this is typically how we've been doing it or how everyone's been doing it really. You have your Excel sheet, you maybe you have multiple tabs. In the first one, you have your scores, your sample by gene, you have your group info, and then you have your gene info here. I'll just be another note. With bigger data sets, though, we need to be able to, uh, we want a format which will really give us more. Okay, we want a standards like we saw in SAM, um, big wigs, some standard which people really want to follow and can invest in. We need this to be cross platform because we want to be working different computers, Macs, Linux, Windows, but also maybe we want to be able to work in Python or C or Java. We want a format which we allow us all to interact with this. It needs to be able to maintain this relationship between data and metadata. Um, and because data is getting big, it needs to be fast and efficient um, without using all my memory on my laptop. Right? So we have just that in this HDF5 format. This is hierarchical data format. This is developed by their own group, HDF5 group, and they produced a format and an associated set of software libraries, which allows for cross-platform support. It can be run on Python, they are see anything really. 
it's a self-described format. So, you know, passing these around, I would need to tell people what RNA is. They can guess genome for a group of for genome for, but this isn't standardized, right? HDF5 actually describes what is in these form, what is in these slots, what's in the data itself. Okay, so it's self-described. Very fast, memory efficient IO and data operations, an entire rethink about how we handle big data. Um, you know, and I wanted, they say, infinitely sized data sets. I'm not sure that's going to be true, but certainly it's suitable for very large data sets. And where we see this inside genomics is in sCRNA, sC attack, any single cell data sets. We're starting to see these huge matrices of per cell measurements. And remember what Connie showed you, you can have 3,000 cells, 4,000, 6,000 cells, all the genes as well. And on top of that, you have data transformations. Maybe you've made a TISNI, so you still have sample and row information, but it doesn't quite fit. Um, the HDF5 format would allow for all this to be put into one object, and that's exactly what in Python, the LoomPy consortium made Loom files. And these really extend this HDF5 format. They are built on HDF5 format, but they're created for single cell data. Okay, and they would have the main matrix of counts, the row attributes, the column attributes. And really usefully, they also allow you to attach these graphs, like, to, like Connie showed you these Tisney files. So all this is based on HDF5. So that gives us some fantastic benefits. It's implemented in multiple languages. So you can, and people use Loom files as the intermediate to go from Python to R. Do some processing there, but I want to do the visualization in R. You'll do it through a Loom file. And on top of that, we get start to get this fast memory efficient access to sCRNA data and metadata, which we couldn't have done before we started getting this format. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Um, on file formats. You have some more information here on the various formats if you wanted to have uh, a look. I think I'm going to push our next session um, on data repositories just before IGV. So I will see you back uh, when we meet for our next session. Is there any questions on this at all? Perfect. Okay. So I'll see everyone in, I think it's 12.30. Matt, do we come back at 12.30? I'm just checking. Um, we come back at one o'clock. We have one till 2 p.m. Great. 1 p.m. So I'll see you at 1 o'clock. Okay, great. So we're going to get on with our second session today. I'm going to start sharing my screen. <laughs> great. So we are in our second session. Am I sharing just my... That will do for now. So here we have our page, bioinformatics, uh, rockefelleruniversity.github.io. And today we've been through genomics data. So I introduced you to um, some of the main types, FASTQ. This is how the data comes back from Connie, FASTA, which FASTQ is an extension of. It's just sequence data. That's how we hold our genomes. SAM and BAM, this is the readable, human readable, 
computational, uh, computer, computer readable uh, equivalent. So this is how we hold our aligned data. So it's our sequences plus where they aligned in the genome. And then we learn a bit about bed, which is our very simple format, just chromosome start end, no other information. We store gene models and gene annotation in GFF and GTF. We learn a little bit about wiggle files, bed graphs, but big wigs are probably the best because they are easy to read by a computer and they're going to be big. Um, as we saw, wiggle files can be very uh, big when you want to cover signal across a whole genome. VCF and MAF I covered briefly and Jidong will show them in action later. And we touched a little bit on HTF5 with particular importance, Loom, which is how we're going to handle all our single cell data and assays. That's the type of format we'll use. So we got through this um, and we had Connie give us an introduction, but I wanted to do just these few slides here. <clears throat> and this is our genomics data repositories. So um, hopefully you'll be sequencing with Connie for your high throughput sequencing experiment. Can I hide my thing? Um, for your high throughput sequencing experiment, but you may decide to augment your experiment that you want to get more information from perhaps collaborators, perhaps they have data they want to share with you. But a lot of um, really interesting data is already being published and you may want to try and relate this to your data. And the place to go get that is from obviously public repositories. Um, so there are several repositories for high throughput sequencing data, um, in particular high throughput sequencing data I'm talking about here. Um, and that is because we have to submit this when we want to do our publication. I think now it's an absolute requirement for really any serious journal. If you want to submit your project, your publication, any data you've used in it, they want to be available to users, um, reviewers, other people picking up your paper. So that means that GEO, ENA and SRA have become huge repositories of publicly uh, available high throughput sequencing data from other people's experiments. Right? So a really rich source of information. And if we know, as we will, how to handle this data, once we've got it, we should be able to do a lot with it. Right? First thing to do, though, is know where to get it from. And I'm going to speak through this in order. The first place and probably the most popular place um, for holding uh, sequencing data is this gene expression omnibus. And perhaps <clears throat> slightly counterintuitively, it's still called gene expression, but it can hold really any type of sequencing data there. Um, different types of biological data sets. It is very popular. It is the most popular. And you'll often see a GOID in a paper, and that is the reference to where it will exist in this database. What's really nice about GEO is it captures a lot of metadata captures the raw data in some way, or at least it will refer to it, where to get it. Um, but also, in contrast to some of these other databases, it has some processed files. GEO was not built by the name, you can guess. It was not built for high throughput sequencing data. I think it was built for array data. Um, so there are features and there are aspects of it which don't quite fit with modern day um, how we want to retrieve our high throughput sequencing data. So I think I was going to take you to um, the actual place. So here we have uh, GEO, GEO datasets is what I'm on. This is the website. And if I wanted to search for something, which I have here, I can search for my particular, not for an ID here, but I'm going to look for Mick in this cell line. And I want some chip seek. I can see I have lots of, uh, descriptions here of various uh, sequencing runs, various projects. And this was the one I'm particularly interested in. If you come into this page, you can see it's really rich, full of information. I've got my GSE ID here. Um, I've got details on the actual experiment, a summary. And there is no um, you know, formal standards here. So often the summary can very much vary in quality, but there are some expectations have all this information and then we will have the information on the individual samples in this project and if I look somewhere in here 
mic. Oh, maybe not. Somewhere in here we have CH12 and mic. Let me try and get my control F working. Oh, I'm already looking for it. Oh, there it is. CH12 mic. And we can go in here and we have even more information on how that data was produced, you know, characteristics of the samples, the antibody. And really importantly to us, <clears throat> we actually have some data we can get and we should recognize these now. Narrow peak file. This is our bed like file from ENCODE. This whole project was ENCODE. So we can download that from an FTP or an HTTP. We could then visualize that in IGV later on. Maybe we should try that. We've also got this bigwig, right? So we've told you that this is a summarized uh, file. It shows signal per base pair. So they've made that available to us here. They give us a description of what that is. There is actually no sequencing available on this page. And if I wanted to go find the sequence data, the raw sequence data now, I'll have to move to its companion database. And that is the next thing we're going to cover. And that's SRA. So whereas Geo wasn't built for sequence data, they obviously took it very seriously. Um, and a long time ago, they established this short read archive. So Illumina sequencing is all short read, pack bio like Connie referred to and what we will have later on in these sessions, that's long read, right? But for short reads, SRA is the archive attached to GEO, it's associated with NCBI. And this contains really sequence specific metadata. It stores the raw data and raw data only. There is no bigwig or bed files there. The thing which is a little bit problematic for me with SRA is it has, and I think this is historical, its own format, SRA format, and that requires a particular toolkit to go and um, actually access and get this data. Okay, so I've been telling you about FASTQ, but to get to FASTQ, you need to go through an intermediate stage. So this is our SRA now, we're on the SRA database rather than GEO. Links back and forward, and it gives me some description. If I actually click on the run here, it's gonna take me to more information um, on the actual sequencing. Most importantly, we have general size, number of bases, when it was published. Most importantly, we have links and descriptions of how we can get this data. Okay, so they have their internal location, but they also have it set up on AWS. So they have multiple places we can retrieve this from, which actually makes SRA quite a stable location if you want to access this data. So that's SRA, and that's really only useful for the raw sequence data get everything processed from, <clears throat> from the GEO, right? But those are linked. So the European nucleotide archive, and this isn't just because I'm European, um, I find a little bit more friendly. It is uh, effectively the European high throughput sequencing repository. It acts as a mirror for SRA. That's not quite true. SRA is usually a little bit ahead. So although it, it's not, it's, it does reflect it, it's not an exact mirror. This only stores raw data, but usefully it stores raw data as FASTQ by default. Okay, so I don't need to worry about retrieving it from a slightly through this toolkit. I can actually go there. Usually I'll find the same information I got on SRA because it should be a mirror and I can just get this FASTQ. And actually, if we look, one pain about the um, ENA is it isn't quite so good to search by. So actually, a lot of the time, I will have to go and grab my SRR ID from GEO or a GEO ID. And I will try and search that. It's found the information on this now. Although, you know, it was there, the information, it was MIC CH12. It just didn't have quite the same search abilities. And we get here a nice table and I can download this if I need be with my TSV. But most usefully I have a link here, which allows me to click and it's gonna go download the FASTQ, which I need to start doing all this processing, right? So this is the rawest data, the, you know, the rawest data I can really get associated to this file. I find it perhaps easiest to get there through DNA. Okay, so we're gonna show you, I think, how you can do this programmatically anyway but finding it and being able to download it with a click is, is pretty straightforward. 
There are other repositories, and I'm not going to go into too much information about this, but there are, whereas these are the main repositories for which people will submit their data um, and then will hold the FASTQ data, there are many repositories typically built around consortiums which are producing a lot of data, um, which hold more custom focused uh, data sets. Um, and ENCODE obviously is a fantastic example of this, and it just keeps getting better over time, the ENCODE um, portal where we can go get this information. UCSC also contains lots of this useful information. So their genome browser has lots of tables we can go and make that link work. So this also has places with things we can download, etc. But I really wanted to show you the um, ENCODE portal, because this is a really fantastic portal. In fact, I've already skipped ahead and searched it. But if we go to the top level, you can see that we can search this portal and we can see all the different types of experiments. And this is being added on with various new consortiums. And this is easy to search. I can just do my MIC, oh, Mac, MIC, CH12 uh, ChIP-seq. I should be able to pull up straight away uh, my sample. And what you will find in here, as opposed to these raw data repositories, is really a lot of very specific information. Okay, so here we have how the data was generated, and actually, most usefully, we have all the different stages of alignment um, across here, right? So we have our BAMs, we talked about them, they're the binary version of the um, SAM files. So if we wanted to, we can kind of skip halfway through the processing and get the BAMs, or we can get the beds or the narrow peak. Right? We tell me these are kind of equivalent. I can get big wigs showing various types of signal over the genome, fold change over control, signal p-value. Okay. So this contains a lot more of both the uh, process data, but also uh, FASTQ and a little bit more information. Okay. So ENCODE, we can really get everything from, but ENCODE's only ever going to cover the data they have. GEO, SRA, ENA, these are the portals, these are the repositories that contain most of the published data. Beyond even like ENCODE, we still have lots of very specialist databases. And I just wanted to really bring the attention to two. One is the Expression Atlas, um, maybe ImGen, BodyMap. These are really fantastic. Uh, ImGen, I'm, I'm a big fan of. Um, <clears throat> but the Expression Atlas we're actually going to use in the course, and we're going to retrieve some data from there. And if you don't really want to do processing and analysis, you can still go to these repositories and pull out pre-summarized data sets, and you can start to investigate within their own GUIs, how does this gene express in this sample? Or how does my favorite tissue express this particular mark? The recount database is really fantastic because it's actually built by some of the people who put together things like Callisto. And this contains pre-counted, uh, pre-summarized signal over genes for as many data sets as they can really um, work through. So a recount database is really fantastic. Final thing I was going to talk about was reference data. So we talked about how we can get fast cues. Um, raw other people's raw sequence data from things like SRA, ENA, GEO. But I also said in our first lecture, we need a reference genome. This is essential in order to put our um, sequence data on, in order to map our sequence data to. So um, they are available from many different locations. You can go and get your reference genome from Ensemble, ENCODE. In fact, we're going to show you that you can just use the internal uh, systems within Bioconductor to build your own references. Um, actually, a really fantastic source of your reference, if I can get this to open, of reference information comes from Illumina itself in iGenomes. Okay, so what they have done is put together for many of the common reference genomes, they've put together big packages of um, big packets, which you will download. So if I come to this my human here, Homo sapiens, we have our major bills, GRC 37, we have GRC 38 here. Um, if I was to download this, and I won't, 
it's going to bring down with it the fasters, the gene models, any annotation I need, Illumina have really put together and maintained within this iGenomes directory. So I think this is one of the best places to go get all the annotation in one go and all the reference data you need. We're also going to show you how to do this programmatically. So that's just a little talk about you know where we can get some of this sequence data from without necessarily having to sequence it ourselves. And, um, a lot of the time we will work with our users to take external data sets, process them, and then overlay them to their own data sets.